Thank you for joining us today. I'm just honored to be sitting across from you, interviewing you, and to have you here with us. You're welcome, Anne. I'm glad to be here. Most people already know that you paved the way for women by being the first woman on, appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. But I think fewer people know that you also paved the way in Arizona by being the first woman uh, majority leader in any state senate. Right. In fact, there, there had been no woman legislative leader in any post so, in, across the country. And amazing. it was such a surprise to me when my colleagues uh, voted in a closed ballot to select me as the majority leader. I was shocked. But it was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot. What would you say were um, some of the challenges that might have came along with? Well, the challenges in those days was that it's a, a small state senate. There are uh, 32 members. And I was a Republican. And the Republicans held a majority of one. So it was very challenging to work with that very narrow majority in the Republican Party. And what it meant was that for many pieces of legislation, in order to pass anything, we had to have support from the other side of the aisle. Luckily, it was a time in Arizona when I don't think the political feelings were as partisan as they seem to be at times today. And there were many instances when legislators from both parties would work together on legislation for the state. And so I was fortunate, I think, to be in the legislature at that time. Now and then, there are issues that are essentially partisan issues, and you don't get cooperation from the other side. But fortunately, when I was serving on most pieces of legislation, there were divided votes. Okay, and would you say there were any challenges in particular that, um, along with your leadership post, that stemmed from being a woman? Well, one of my projects when I was in the legislature was to go through every one of Arizona's statutes, every one, and look at the ones that um, appeared, at least, uh, as written, to discriminate against women and to get them changed. And that was quite a challenge. There were a lot of statutes. Arizona is a community property state. We got our laws on community property and many of our water laws from Spain. I don't know how many people realize that. But it's a part of our ancient Spanish heritage from the early Spaniards who came here. And in the community property laws at the time I was in the legislature, all the control and management were given to the husband, not the wife. The wife was entitled to half of the value, but had no control over it. And it was the husband who had the right to sell the property or to acquire it, whatever it was. And so we were able to get that change, to give uh, the wife uh, an equal voice in those decisions. And that was a major change. There were many other laws um, affecting women's working hours and weightlifting requirements and so on, uh, many of which had to be changed as well. But that was a big project. And uh, the other project that I remember working on was to try to improve the situation for retarded people. We had a center for retarded people in central Arizona, and the laws concerning how people were adjudicated, retarded, and sent there and kept there uh, needed some review and some change, and we were able to do that as well. And um, I was able, with considerable effort, to get a proposition on the ballot to change Arizona's system of selection of judges. Arizona, as originally formed, uh, had partisan election of all of its judges, both at the Supreme Court level and later in an intermediate appellate court was formed and at that level, as well as at the trial court level. They were elected in partisan elections. And it was my hope that we could move to a system of initial appointment 
of the appellate court judges and the judges in Maricopa County by the governor from a list of qualified people of both parties supplied by a bipartisan commission that had lay people as well as lawyers on it and presided over by the chief justice. And I could never get that. It required a constitutional change for Arizona's constitution. And I could get the proposed change out of the state senate where I served, but not out of the House of Representatives. So we formed a statewide committee. And the committee uh, was able to get enough signatures of registered voters in Arizona to put it on the ballot by initiative. And the same year that I decided I had served long enough in the state senate and that I would like very much to serve as a judge in Arizona, I ran for the office of Superior Court judge in the same election where the ballot proposition I had worked so hard on was on the ballot. And happily, I was elected as a judge and the constitutional change was approved by the voters. Now, I lived in Arizona long enough after that change to see how nicely it worked. I think today, Arizona probably has close to the best judicial system of any state in the United States. It's really first rate, and we've been the beneficiaries of that change. Could you talk a little bit also about your appointment to the US Supreme Court? Well, that came later. I had, before I do that, it probably uh, bears saying that I was very privileged in the years that I lived in the Phoenix area to serve in all three branches of Arizona state government. My first job was right here in this building, the old state capitol, in the office of the Attorney General. I was hired by um, a man named Darrell Smith, who then was the Attorney General of Arizona and was made a deputy. Now, there weren't any women in the Attorney General's office in those days, at least as assistant attorneys general, and they weren't too sure what to do with me. So I was sent out to a little office in the Arizona State Hospital for the Mentally Ill. It's out on Van Buren at 24th Street. And I wasn't entirely sure what I should do out there, but what I did was to have meetings with all the medical staff, doctors and then nurses, and meetings with the board of the state hospital. There was a citizen board for the hospital. And then I met with uh, representatives of many of the patients at the hospital to see what their legal needs were. And it turned out that Arizona was, it was a time when people were committed to the Arizona State Hospital as being mentally ill and they were simply taken from their homes and jobs and put in the hospital involuntarily by judicial order. And it was a time when doctors had developed certain um, medical treatments, certain drug treatments that could help for someone with schizophrenia, for example, or other conditions. And there were a number of patients in the hospital who, if they were on the proper medication, were clear enough in their minds that they could function outside the hospital. And yet they were required to be committed because they had been found to be mentally ill and there was no way to be released while they were on medication. So we worked on a change in the statutes in Arizona to enable the release of patients who were able to maintain themselves on the proper medication and to function outside. That was a huge change and a very helpful one, I think. And there were a number of other changes that helped the state hospital. So after uh, perhaps less than a year, I returned to the main office of the Attorney General's office and then uh, was able to do legal work at times for the governor, for the legislature, for the state auditor, and the state treasurer and all kinds of state boards and commissions. And it was a wonderful job. I really 
enjoyed so much the time that I served in the Attorney General's office. I remember that I was even privileged to argue a couple of, case, a couple of cases at that time here in this very room in the old Supreme Court chamber before the Arizona Supreme Court. And that was, of course, exciting to be able to do. And uh, I valued so much the time that I spent in the Attorney General's office. It was wonderful. And while I was serving in the Attorney General's office, there was a vacancy in the legislative district in which I lived. And I had been active um, as a district chairman for the Republicans in my district and was acquainted with uh, people in the legislature. I was appointed to fill that vacancy that had occurred. And the appointment in those days was made by the County Board of Supervisors. I don't know if that's still a law or not. But I was appointed as a state senator by the County Board of Supervisors to fill the vacancy. And uh, I served immediately on the State, County, and Municipal Affairs Committee and on the Judiciary Committee. And I was made chairman rather soon of the State, County, and Municipal Affairs Committee, which I enjoyed a lot. I'd done so much work in the Attorney General's office in that area that it was uh, most enjoyable to get to work on the Legislative Committee. Then I had to run for office in my district and was elected uh, for my first full term. And um, then I ran again for a second full term and that was when I was selected as majority leader. And uh, that kept me very busy indeed uh, year round. There are so many things that had to be attended to. And then it seems like you only got busier after that. Well, in, um, I was, as I mentioned, elected to the um, trial court, to the superior court in Maricopa County. And that was a complete change of roles because as a legislator, you can decide what issues you want to work on and you can develop yourself legislative proposals and you can go out to the public and talk to them and get their ideas about what ought to be done. As a judge, you don't have any choice about what comes across your desk. You have to take the cases assigned to you as a judge, whether you like them or not, and you have to resolve them um, in your capacity as a, a trial judge. And sitting as a trial judge, I've often said, is a little like watching a soap opera all day every day because you hear so many different stories. You preside over trials. Some of them are... Um, arise out of auto accidents or other accidents. Some are suits about contracts. Some are criminal cases. And you hear these stories develop through the testimony of witnesses. And some of what you hear makes you very sad, but you can't cry. Some of them make you want to laugh, but you can't laugh. And you hear all these amazing stories day in and day out. It was very interesting work and uh, kept me very busy. I often had uh, two or more juries out deciding cases while I was trying another case in the courtroom. It was very, very busy. When they say, sit on the bench, they really mean it. You never have enough time to do anything else. In your book, Lazy Bee, yes. you um, recount um, several stories from your childhood as a cowgirl living on a ranch in the Southwest. Um, how would you, you say your childhood experiences prepared you for your leadership roles later in life? I was fortunate, I think, as a youngster. Uh, my parents were operating a ranch that had been started by my grandfather day that is uh, half in Greenlee County, Arizona, along the Gila River, and half in Hidalgo County, New Mexico. The house was actually physically in Arizona, so we were Arizona residents. And that ranch was in a very remote area. We were between two small towns, Duncan, Arizona, and Lordsburg, New Mexico. 
and we were far enough from town that we would only go to town once a week to get the mail and to buy some groceries. And other than that, we were out on the ranch trying to do the ranch work. I think any youngster who's lucky enough to grow up on a ranch or a farm in a remote area has the experience I did. You have to help do the work on the ranch. We had jobs to do, things to do, and you were given a certain amount of responsibility at an early age to get things done. And nobody cared if you were a young girl, whatever you were, as long as you could do the job, people would let you do it, and they liked it. So that was how I grew up, and I think it's a very healthy thing. It probably teaches a youngster a considerable amount of independence and probably a little self-confidence as you learn how to do things and um, take care of things. It was a good experience. And during your post on the U.S. Supreme Court, um, were there any times you looked back to your childhood and drew from your experiences then to, I don't know, um, help you overcome challenges? I think that everyone, whatever they do, uh, is a product of those years as a young person growing up in whatever environment it happened. Uh, we're all shaped by those early experiences, and I'm sure that I was very much so shaped by my life and work on the Lazy Bee Ranch. What would you hope young Arizonans and young Americans learn from you, learn from your accomplishments? Well, I think the main thing that happened as a result of my life and experience was when President Reagan decided to put a woman on the U.S. Supreme Court in the highest position that any woman in this country had achieved. And that opened doors for women all across this country immediately. And it opened doors for women worldwide, actually. It received an enormous amount of attention worldwide. And all of a sudden, opportunities started to emerge for women in every state and around the globe. And it was such a thrill for me to see that happen. We began to have women on um, state uh, Supreme Courts and appellate courts almost immediately and in almost every state. And that was just a marvelous thing for me to see. And it opened opportunities for women in other fields, not just um, judicial. Um, Arizona, indeed, has a tradition of women on the bench. The first woman to become a state Supreme Court Chief Justice was an Arizona woman, Lorna Lockwood, who sat and presided in this very room. And what are some of the things you learned from Lorna Lockwood, would you say? She was a wonderful person, and when I first came to back to Phoenix, after my husband got out of the service, it was in 1957. There were not many women lawyers in Phoenix or any place else in those days. The law firms in Arizona were not hiring women lawyers. They still wouldn't take them. But um, I would get together maybe once a month or so with the women lawyers who were, in fact, in the Phoenix area, and if she could, Justice Lorna Lockwood would come and join us for lunch, and we often would sit around one small round table in the Arizona Club and have lunch. There were so few of us that we could do that. It was amazing. But Justice Lockwood took a real interest in the women lawyers and liked to be uh, helpful in any way she could. That was good. What would you hope that young Americans, and not just young Americans, Americans of all ages, are mindful of during Women's History Month and then all, all year long? About well, of course, in Women's History Month, it's a good idea to look back and see how relatively recently women in this country got the right to vote, 1922. I mean, they didn't have the right to vote, which is amazing at a national level. Um, a couple of the states had granted uh, state voting rights to women, but that was rare. And um, the whole um, evolution of women in the workplace and with political rights and the right to vote um, was a product of the last half of the 1900s. 
And um, I just feel so privileged and fortunate that I grew up at a time when opportunities for women were changing. And today, I think young women can find work in any business or profession they choose. And what a blessing that is, because at least half of our population are women, and they have as much talent uh, as men. So it's great that we don't waste that talent anymore. As a woman attorney, could you describe what it was like trying to get a job right after college? I graduated from Stanford Law School in 1952. Now that's a long time ago. But that was the year of my law school graduation. There were notices on the placement bulletin board at the law school from law firms all over the state of California. I graduated from law school at Stanford Law School in Palo Alto, California. And the placement board had all these notices asking Stanford law graduates to call the law firm for an interview about a job, saying that they would be very interested in hiring a Stanford law graduate. And I called the law firms, and not one of them would talk to me. Wouldn't even talk to me. They said, well, you're a woman. We don't hire women lawyers. And I think I had been very naive when I went to law school because I didn't realize that when I graduated from law school that a law firm wouldn't consider me for a job. I was stunned. And I had had a very good record in law school, good grades, order of the coif, law review, so on. And they wouldn't talk to me. I finally <coughs> asked a young woman, friend of mine from undergraduate days at Stanford, if she would talk to her father. Her father was a senior partner in one of California's big law firms. I said, would you ask your father if he could get me an interview? And she said, yes, I'll ask, and she did, and her father arranged for me to have an interview at the law firm. It was uh, headquartered in Los Angeles, so I made a trip to Los Angeles and met with the senior partner, and he looked at my resume and he said, well, Miss Day, you have a very fine record in law school, congratulations. But our firm has never hired a woman lawyer. And Miss Day, I do not see the time when we will. Our clients would not accept that. He said, um, Miss Day, how do you type? And I said, well, fair, I'm not the best, but fair. He said, if you can type well enough, I might be able to get you a job here as a legal secretary. And I said, thank you, but I wanted to work as a lawyer, not as a legal secretary. So I declined that potential offer and continued my search. I had met my husband-to-be, John, fall in law school at Stanford. We were planning to be married, and he was a year behind me and still was in school. So one of us had to work. And that was me. And I wanted to work as a lawyer. I heard that the district attorney in San Mateo County, California, had once had a woman lawyer on his staff. So I made an appointment to go see him in hopes that he would consider another one. And we had a wonderful visit. He was an elected district attorney and a very pleasant man. He was an Italian-American. And um, he looked at my resume and said, oh, Miss Day, you have a wonderful resume. It would be great to have you here. But, he said, I get financial support from the County Board of Supervisors, and I am not budgeted. I have no money to hire another deputy right now. And so I don't know how I could hire you. And he said, I have shown you around my office, and you can see I don't have a vacant office either, so I don't know where I would put another deputy. And so I suggested to the district attorney that um, I had met his secretary, who was a very nice woman, and in a pretty large space, and I said, if your secretary wouldn't mind, I'd be willing to put a desk in her office where she is and sit with her. And I said, I know you don't have any money to hire anyone, but I'd be happy to work for you for nothing for a while. 
until you can get the district, um, the Board of Supervisors to give you a little additional money to hire me. And that's what we did. That was the deal we struck. Oh. No pay and sitting with his secretary. How long did you work for no pay? I think I had been there probably about three months when uh, it turned out that the district attorney was appointed county judge. So he was happy about that. He left to be the county judge. My supervisor became the district attorney and that created a bona fide vacancy in the office, which I filled with pay and with an office. <laughs> well, it's definitely been an honor for me to interview you today. I'm so glad you could. Thank you, Anne. I enjoyed doing it and good luck to you. Thank you. you.